host Matt Parrott, and I've got uh, Caleb with me. Let's, let's do an audio check real quick. Caleb, can you hear me just fine? Sure, can hear you just fine. Can you hear me? I can, I can hear you just great, and uh, the chat here is okay. Excellent. Okay, I think, yep, we are good to go. Okay, so uh, uh, Caleb Alpin is a widely acclaimed advocate for the working family whose thoughts on 21st century socialism have both informed and inspired my own work uh, lately. Oh. I would call him uh, a tanky, uh, and uh, mainstream neo-libs and neo-cons would uh, call Caleb everything else in the book. Uh, <laughs> uh, while he and I strongly disagree on several things, I'm honored to have him on the show. Uh, Mr. Maupin, welcome to Radio Free Indiana. Sure. Um, thanks for having me on. Um, I would take any invitation to talk about my book. I wrote the book, Kamala Harris and the Future of America, because I want to, you know, raise awareness about the danger uh, that is posed by our incoming vice president and possibly, you know, future president, very likely. Um, and, you know, if CNN called me up and wanted me on CNN to talk about the book, I would go on there. I went on CNN to talk about Syria. Uh, I vehemently disagree with CNN um, and their, their views uh, when it comes to issues like, you know, foreign policy. I view CNN as responsible for the death of millions of people and the ugly wars they promoted. But I would go on there, right? So, you know, you, on the other hand, you have some views I vehemently disagree with. Uh, there's no support for anti-Semitism on my part. There's no support for white nationalism. I find those views to be repugnant. But you did invite me to come on uh, to talk about my book. And so, you know, I'm happy to take the opportunity to talk about the danger facing all Americans from Kamala Harris. Okay, absolutely understood. Yeah, we, we do have some strong disagreements, and uh, uh, neither one of us are, are going to agree on everything. Uh, but there there is... Uh, um, of everybody I've, I've been following, uh, you seem more than anybody else to have been on top of uh, uh, Kamala from the very beginning. I, I wasn't really familiar with her at all uh, until, uh, until really, I mean, I, I, I'd heard that she was a prosecutor uh, from California or whatever, but it was really in the, uh, the primary debates. Uh, and, and, of course, uh, seeing uh, Representative Gabbard just absolutely mm -hmm. <laughs> mortal combat fatality her. Uh, and I, yeah. I, I thought that was the end for her. I, I thought that that had to be a, a game over discrediting event where her entire her entire stick, her entire pitch to America uh, had been cut off at the knees. Uh, and uh, uh, mysteriously, uh, she bounced right back. So I, I, I guess... Uh, uh, re reading your book, I think, uh, has afforded me an insight into that, and whether we're on the left or the right or the center or foreign or domestic, and we've got them all uh, in my chat room uh, watching this, uh, we need to know who, who this lady is who uh, is not only the vice president, but the uh, incoming vice president, but quite likely a, an especially strong vice president at that, given, you know, the... the the state uh, of president-elect Biden, right? Indeed. Indeed. Um, well, I mean, you talked about that knockout from Tulsi Gabbard. I mean, that was one of the biggest political takedowns I've ever seen, right? Because, I mean, Kamala was rising. The media was just giving her, you know, endless worship and praise. And you'll remember Tulsi Gabbard on that debate stage took, you know, less than a minute to just go over her record as a criminal prosecutor and so many families in this country have suffered uh, from the prison industrial complex and prison for profit, have dealt with ruthless prosecutors who destroy people's lives in order to build their careers. And when they heard that, uh, they were very uninterested in what, what Kamala Harris had to say. Uh, then afterwards, after that debate, you'll remember Anderson Cooper uh, gave Kamala the chance to, to rebut it, right? He's, he basically gave her another chance, just, just, you know, just refute that for us. And all she could say is, you know, Tulsi Gabbard supports Assad, you know, as if that has anything to do with it, right? I mean, it was just an epic political knockout. Kamala got less than 1% of the, of this, of the vote uh, among Democratic primary voters, less than 1%. But reg okay. regardless, she found her way back onto the ticket. Joe Biden is not a young man. Um, and I think there's a very good chance that he'll be retiring and she will be our president because she was selected for us by the Silicon Valley fascists and overlords, uh, by big Wall Street bankers and monopolies, um, and by the forces that were behind the Hillary Clinton State Department. Um, and because of that, uh, she's been picked to rule over us. And actually, the way I got acutely interested in Kamala Harris 
was actually there's a, a big name Marxist economist who I will not name, uh, but he tipped me off about her father, Donald Harris. And Donald Harris uh, taught at Stanford University for many years. He's now retired. He was an economic advisor to the government of Michael Manley in Jamaica. Um, and he is a Marxist economist. I mean, he draws from Marx. He's like a social Democrat. Um, and he has denounced her. And he and Kamala do not speak. Uh, and he made a point of denouncing her in the press. And I thought, there's something here. I mean, there's got to be a story here. So the more I investigated, the more I realized that Kamala Harris fits into a whole trajectory of U.S. politics, uh, where left-wing politics has been consciously distorted, um, and there's been a big effort to, to try and, and foment chaos to serve the, the goals of one particular wing of the American ruling class. And all of this, I thought, had to be written down. So I wrote, you know, Kamala Harris and the Future of America, an essay in three parts. Um, and it's been widely received, uh, well received. Uh, you know, um, uh, many people from both the left and the right have praised the book. Uh, the Daily Communist newspaper in Britain, the Morning Star, reviewed it um, and gave it a very positive review. There was a review written by the journalist Max Perry uh, that was circulated. It was uh, published uh, many parts of the Internet, you know, many places republished it, including the UNS Review, which is a, a more conservative outlet, a more right wing outlet. They, they published it. Many people had positive things to say about it. Um, you know, I, I went there and I think we're going to see what Kamala is all about uh, pretty soon, but it's already quite disturbing. Uh, it kind of reminds me, if you remember uh, back when uh, Sarah Palin was introduced, how uh, she, to me, has very Sarah Palinish vibes of somebody who was obviously groomed and presented uh, by other people and, and who clearly uh, had, was not interested in geopolitical issues or real international states uh statecraft issues until last thursday uh, and you, you see her in these interviews uh it, it's so easy to just uh catch her and then she does that uh maniacal laughter she does when she's cornered <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I i sympathize you know when when i get caught red-handed by my wife uh i i try to laugh my way out of it and it gets about as far yeah uh, but yeah, let me, uh, I, I've got some formal questions here. We're going to sure, end up sure. stumbling over my questions here if we keep talking. Sure thing. Okay, question one. Uh, before we get to Kamala herself, there's some interesting background. Early in your book, you spell out how much of the cultural transformation in the 60s and 70s was orchestrated by the intelligence community as a Cold War tactic, uh, especially via the uh, Berkeley New Left and the CIA's Congress for Cultural Freedom Program. Yeah. So, uh, uh, allow me to quote you real quick from uh, page 15, if you don't mind. Sure thing. Uh, uh, to put it simply, this is uh, Caleb speaking, uh, to put it simply, the new left was fake. It was a covert strategy for opposing communism invented by the intelligence apparatus. The job of the CIA was to create a chorus of left-wing voices who could invoke Marxist language and the rebellious spirit found in many intellectuals while covertly supporting U.S. foreign policy goals. The stated aim was to create a way for peace activists and black civil rights activists to long, no longer see themselves as natural allies of the Soviet Union. Okay, so that, that's you kind of de describing the, the, the mechanism of this new left that she, uh, uh, Vice President-elect Harris, was very much, uh, I will, we'll just call her Kamala, uh, Kamala uh, is, uh, I think, the appropriate for now. Uh, uh, yeah, it's Kamala, not Kamala. I, I got her. Uh, um, so elsewhere you argue that much of the economic prosperity and real progress for working families was similarly driven by a Cold War agenda. You, you had kind of the the social thing that they were doing, and then you also had an economic strategy with the Cold War agenda where the, the Wagner Act unions were kind of uh, propped up and at their strongest when the Soviet Union was at its strongest, right? Okay. So as the Soviet Union faltered, uh, American workers' wages and workplace rights faltered too and have never caught up. Uh, do you see the uh, Cold War dynamic uh, returning in the 21st century's multipolar world? Uh, if so, how is it going to be similar uh, and how might it be different? Well, um, I guess I want to quibble a little bit with what you said there, the last part of your question. Um, basically, I see a divide in the U.S. ruling class uh, between the industrial capitalists, the manufacturers, the factory owners on the one side, uh, and what you can call the Eastern establishment, which are big oil monopolists and bankers on the other side. Um, and that divide played out uh, during the presidency of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the passage of the Wagner Act in 1935, which legalized labor unions, made, made it you know, legal everywhere to be a member of a labor union. 
that played into it. And basically, uh, you know, as the Soviet Union was rising, you have to remember during the Great Depression, most of the world was having, you know, mass poverty and suffering. But the Soviet Union was rapidly industrializing at the time. And communism as a movement was greatly expanding. So there became a division among the U.S. ruling class about how do we defeat the communists. And the factory owner faction, Henry Ford, Henry Morgan, they said what we need is a military state. Uh, they said we need a very authoritarian, you know, conservative society that will get ready for an all-out crusade against the Reds. Um, whereas the Rockefellers and the Eastern Establishment and some of the folks tied in with Britain said, actually, the way to defeat the communists is to try and stabilize the country with progressive social reforms. And Roosevelt aligned himself with the Rockefellers. Um, and so because of that, and, you know, the Rockefellers didn't have much to lose. They weren't factory owners. They were, they were selling oil on the international markets. They were bankers. They weren't going to lose a lot of money if people joined labor unions. Uh, so they were, they were more open to negotiating with the labor movement, uh, aligning with the Soviet Union. Um, and so you had the Wagner Act. You had, you know, Social Security, unemployment insurance. These things came into existence uh, because Roosevelt was actively fighting to prevent a military coup that was, was you know, there, there were many factions of the U.S. ruling class that wanted to remove him. And so he entered a strategic alliance with the far left, with the labor unions uh, to, to beat back uh, the factory owners who were in an alliance with the far right. Um, and, you know, World War II comes about. After the Second World War, you have a very booming economy in the United States. But those two divisions are still very well intact. Right. And McCarthyism was very much an expression of that factory owner wing and a lot of middle class elements uh, who just did not uh, did not, you know, agree with uh, the idea that, that, you know, we should have progressive labor unions and were very afraid of communism. Um, and so McCarthyism emerged. And what was interesting is in a lot of ways, McCarthyism became kind of an uprising by the middle class against big capital. Right. If you look at the John Birch Society, a lot of their literature would say things like Rockefeller is a communist. Henry Morgan is a communist. Well, I mean, these guys weren't communists, but what they were alluding to was that the U.S. government was led by people with a more progressive and more socially liberal agenda uh, than what they what they were advocating. And so you saw that. Um, but at the same time, you know, the military and weapons manufacturing is a big part of the U.S. economy. We talk about military Keynesianism, right, um, and, and military spending. Meanwhile, the intelligence apparatus, right, the soft power intelligence apparatus is very much tied in with the Rockefeller think tanks, with the Ford Foundation. And so you have this divide in the American deep state between the weapons manufacturers and the Pentagon that like big wars and like to blow things up so they can make the tanks and bombs and planes and make a lot of money from it. They don't care if the rest of the world likes the United States. The message is peace through strength. And then you have the Eastern establishment, you know, the CIA, the soft power folks, the big oil companies that say, let's, you know, let's, you know, be gentle um, and let's have people think the United States is a more gentle country. And at the same time, they're actively experimenting with social liberalism. You know, people forget that the Rockefellers were the primary funders of, of what became Planned Parenthood or the Birth Control League. Um, and the reason for that is they're Malthusians. They thought there were too many people in the world. They wanted to reduce the human population. Well, they hired Margaret Sanger, who was a socialist, who didn't like the fact that the Soviet Union wasn't the free sex, free love paradise she thought it would be. It was actually quite a conservative society in the 1930s. Um, so because of that, she, you know, sells out socialism for sex um, and she signs up with with, uh, you know, with the Rockefellers. She sets up the Birth Control League. Uh, you also have Alfred Kinsey, who's in Indiana, where you're you're in Indiana, right? Alfred Kinsey yeah, of the Kinsey I'm Report. Dropout, yeah. yeah, yeah. And he's he's his work is paid for by by the Rockefellers and it promotes the idea that homosexuality is much more common. Um, and actually, you know, he utilizes pedophiles in his research. That's kind of glossed over by a lot of history. But he actually utilizes a pedophile to conduct a lot of research and. And there's there's stuff done to children that would be illegal and is illegal. And and, you know, he's quite a disgusting individual. But the Rockefellers are very much all about free love, birth control, abortion, things that that regular conservatives don't particularly care for. Um, and, and essentially, the Rockefellers are pushed out of the Republican Party. Um, and, and, you know, especially, you know, with the rise of Barry Goldwater, um, you know, I mean, they, I think, believe uh, there's a figure in the Rockefeller family who said something to the effect of there's a whiff of fascism coming out of the Republican Party. So they're pushed into the Democratic Party. Um, and so that's a divide. But it's also important to note that the CIA had a, a program they started in the early 1950s uh, called the Congress for Cultural Freedom. And it was a program to fund left-wing activism 
Um, and uh, it was a program to, you know, give money to left-wing activism that was anti-Soviet. It was, you know, they gave money, they set up all kinds of magazines. Uh, Partisan Review magazine was a Trotskyite, anti-Soviet, Marxist magazine that was immediately available on all the college campuses. Uh, there was, uh, in Germany, there was Der Monat, uh, which was a similar thing, and that's where the Frankfurt School and Adorno comes out of, right, is Der Monat. And, and a lot of what people call the new left can be traced back to CIA uh, money. I mean, and, and very, very well documentedly and very admittedly. I mean, there's whole books written about what they call the cultural Cold War. This is a reality. Kamala Harris grew up in that milieu, right? Um, you know, she attended this community center that was set up in Berkeley. Um, it was called uh, Rainbow Sign. Uh, it was run by a personal friend of James Baldwin. James Baldwin was very much a CIA creation. James Baldwin never would have become famous if it hadn't been for lots of CIA money pumped into his anti-communist black radicalism. Um, and that Kamala Harris, you know, I mean, she grew up in this, this you know, this cultural leftism that was anti-Soviet, anti-Marxist, but also also very, very socially liberal and also very much uh, decrying racism. And I talk about this. I mean, there were whole festivals in Senegal, uh, the Black Arts Festival in 1966 in Senegal, all things paid for by the CIA. And it's set up to show the world, look, the United States doesn't really hate black people. The United States loves black people and black people have their grievances and they're marching, but the Soviets aren't their friend. And, and you know, there, there was all kinds of efforts to try and change the image of the United States to be one that is more socially liberal. Um, and then in doing so, kind of steal the thunder of, of the communists and, and really to create a sense of ambiguity. And this, this shows up if you read a lot of CIA writing from the 50s. If you read about, for example, there's a very good book called the Search for the Manchurian Candidate. And it talks about CIA brainwashing and how it worked. And they discovered, you know, during the Korean War, a lot of American GIs would go and fight in the Korean War. They'd get captured. They'd go to the prisoner of war camp and they would become communists, right? This happened. Thousands of US GIs became communists. And the CIA realized the guys who became communists in the, in the POW camps were the ones who were the most, you know, dedicated, the most, you know, the most, uh, the most patriotic, the most deeply conservative. They were the ones who ultimately became communists, while the more liberal ones were the ones who never really became communists, right? And that, that, that they realized that this kind, of, this, this kind of dualistic thinking that says there's right or wrong, there's actually truth in the world, God forbid, that there's, that that, that leads people to, if, if, you know, push comes to shove, they might change to be a communist. But if you introduce into the world this idea that, uh, that there, there is no truth, that right and wrong don't exist, that everything's simply a matter of opinion, um, you know, uh, if you do that, uh, then it's very hard to convince people of anything, right? And that postmodernism and, and this kind of liberalizing U.S. culture to get people to believe there is no truth, there is no reality, everything's a matter of opinion, was a way of preventing, if there was some kind of crisis in the United States, people from becoming communists. And that was happening already in the black community. Many black people were very angry at the American government because of Jim Crow and such. And so it was just considered automatic on their part to become communists, right? The Civil Rights Congress was started by the Communist Party. W.E.B. Du Bois was a communist. Uh, Paul Robeson was a communist. I mean, the communists had been talking about the civil rights issue. It was a big problem. The CIA is like, oh my gosh, all the black people, when they get mad at the American government, they become communists. Let's create a way that they can be critical of the American government, but not become communists. And that's what this covert CIA funding of leftism was all about. And a lot of leftists are very naive and almost in denial about this. They want to pretend that this didn't happen. They want to pretend like, no, the CIA, they're all Republicans. And no, no, no. I mean, there is a liberal wing of the American establishment. There is the Rockefellers. And now Silicon Valley is very much an outgrowth of that Eastern establishment that has its own energy. Um, and that there is a, a faction within the ruling class of the United States that is very liberal, I guess, but is very, very destructive and very, very dangerous and is kind of hell-bent on fomenting some kind of dangerous global revolution. And that's a concern. And, you know, Kamala Harris is very, very closely tied into some very, very dangerous people. And the Hillary Clinton State Department did a huge amount of damage in the world. Um, there's no question about it. We're still picking up the pieces. They overthrew the government. Oh, the government of Honduras was violently overthrown in 2009. And now, look, I mean, people are piling on our border trying to get out of a country that now has the world's highest murder rate uh, since it's been opened up to the, the, the free market. Um, you know, I mean, the overthrow of the government of Libya, which had the highest life expectancy on the African continent, 
has now been reduced to rubble and chaos and people are drowning in the Mediterranean trying to get out. Syria reduced to civil war. I mean, the amount of death and suffering and chaos fomented by the Hillary Clinton State Department is massive. But, you know, in their minds, they did a great job, right? They're spreading freedom around the world. This is the, the permanent global revolution to spread the ideals of freedom and create the open international system. It's very disturbing stuff. Right, I, I agree. Uh, I, I feel like uh, Kinsey is one of those rare uh, people who is going is ending up being justifiably canceled by both the right and the left, <laughs> as he should be. Well, they made a movie about him, yeah, Liam Neeson or whatever. <laughs> I mean, uh, what? they made a movie about him, right? Liam Neeson, yeah. you know, and they gloss over all the the ugly side of him, but yeah, yeah, they did. But I think I think things are evolving. I'm looking forward to him eventually being because he, he really was a contemptible human being. Mm. Uh, I, I've written a, a lot about a lot of what you're talking about. I, I, I kind of take a, a different tone with it, with the uh, calling it neo-colonial uh, capitalism and the uh, how white supremacy, overt white supremacy in the 1960s, uh, flipped over while still being functionally the same thing into a white saviorism. Hmm. Uh, that is the term I use, where it, it's 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 patronizing, but it's still uh, it, it, it's still structured. Uh, as white supremacists, uh, and that's, uh, um, I don't expect you to agree with me, I don't expect anybody, but there's a, there's a, there's an inversion process where seemingly overnight America went from being explicitly white supremacist mm -hmm. to, uh, officially being sort of, uh, the opposite, mm -hmm. but it, it, if you look, look under the hood of how that's structured, it's still kind of white supremacist in, in how it's in how it's structured, mm -hmm. uh, but that's uh, just for my audience. Uh, um, Interesting. A lot of what he's talking about here very much uh, ties into how how the CIA was uh, moving the culture. Uh, on to question two, if you don't have a follow up there, um, I'm going to quote the book again, uh, page twenty. Uh, begin quote. Uh, while Marxist-Leninist parties focused on building disciplined cadre organizations aiming to mobilize U.S. workers to seize power. The new left of dope-smoking middle-class freaks <laughs> was quite useful in pulling potential revolutionaries away from them. Okay, so in my opinion, this erection of a fake left is at least as much in effect now as it was then, mm -hmm. as well as on the right. Uh, uh, struggling families are in absolute crisis this year, and both sides are against the American worker. Uh, uh, how is authentic leftist agitation for the working-class families supposed to compete uh, against the pronouns, the parades, and the Democratic Party. How, 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 who's going to stand up for the American worker given how the duopoly is structured right now? Well, that's, you know, that I'm, I consider myself to be part of the left. Um, you know, I, I am a leftist in, in everything I do. I have a Marxist Leninist perspective. I'm influenced by other forms of socialism, such as Baathist Arab socialism or, or Bolivarianism, uh, and, you know, Deng Xiaoping theory and other things. But, but I have a left-wing perspective, but I've noticed that, that on the left, um, there has very much been a culture that has been created where if you actually talk about economic demands, um, if you talk about the things the Communist Party talked about in the 30s or the IWW talked about before that, uh, then they accuse you of being a Nazi. Um, you know, and I mean, I, and it, it's shocking to me. Um, and, uh, you know, the campaign right now against Jimmy Dore, uh, is astounding to me. I got on, I got on Twitter on Sunday and I saw trending terms that said Jimmy Dore. And I thought, is that trending for me? Cause I listened to him. It's like, no, it was trending for the whole internet. And every Democrat was saying Jimmy Cor Jimmy Dore is a bad person. How dare he criticize AOC for, for selling out on the healthcare and not, you know, taking it to the floor. And, and it, it's kind of shocking to me that there is this demand that, that leftist politics be reduced to uh, kind of a culture war against middle America. You know, if you're not on board with with some of the the more extreme things that uh, that the the social liberals of the far left uh, agree with, if you're not on board with that immediately, if you just so much as ask a question, you don't state it in the exact right way, uh, you're done and you're attacked. I mean, and it's it's shocking to me. I. Um, I find it very, very shocking. Um, but that's kind of the culture that's developed. But this is the, the culmination of, you read Susan Sontag, right? Susan Sontag, I've quoted this many times before, but Susan Sontag, you know, who is this CIA intellectual, you know, she's propped up by the Congress for Cultural Freedom. One of the things that she said in the 1980s, she was speaking at a rally against the, the communist government of Poland. And she said that communism is nothing but the most effective form of fascism. You know, and that that, you know, to those of us on the far left, that wouldn't make any sense. 
But if you read Susan Sontag's writings, it does make sense. In, in, as far as she's concerned, fascism is whenever working class people uh, get together and start fighting for their rights. And the left, the left is about protecting intellectuals and protecting the freedom of the intellectual from the inferior rabble. It's about managing and controlling the inferior rabble who might, you know, suppress the intellectual. And that comes across in Hannah Arendt's writing as well. Um, it also comes across its Ayn Rand and Atlas Shrugged and stuff. And that, you know, neo, neoliberal economics, uh, you, know, uh, you know, on the right, the right pushed like the economic side of it. Uh, but the left pushed a kind of a social side on it, but it all emphasized individualism, right? Individualism above all else was the idea. Um, and that was, that was something that was really, really developing. And that, you know, seemed to be the thrust. The neocons pushed neoliberal economics, Milton Friedman, privatize everything, cut government spending, you're on your own, personal responsibility. The left pushed individual freedom, right? You know, no longer do you have any obligation to your country or to your community or to your society. Just do your own thing, man. Hang loose. Um, and it was about breaking society down into atomized individuals so they can be more easily controlled and that the, this intellectual class, these, uh, this, this, this aristocracy of, of intellectuals can be protected from the, the people who, who might want to restrain them or control them. Yeah, it's uh, alienation and individualism as being sort of an asset that's uh, um, spit on, on us uh, to dissolve us so we can be more easily digested by the, the capitalist oligarchs. Uh, but uh, we, uh, the thing about Representative Ocasio-Cortez, uh, she reminds me of sort of the, the left-wing Trump in that uh, she talks to the left and to the popular uh, zeitgeist while walking to the right. Uh, and, and Trump does the same thing. Trump has uh, Trump has governed just like Ted Cruz or Mitt Romney, uh, but his Twitter is absolute fire from a right wing populist perspective, right? But if you actually look at what he's actually done, uh, it, it, it's it's standard Republican. It's a, I feel like it's the same way with uh, uh, Ocasio Cortez. She she presents herself as this uh, authentically left. Uh, savior of the working family and the minority and the immigrant, uh, but at the end of the day, she falls right in line behind Nancy's neoliberal agenda. Uh, and uh, Jimmy kind of was like trying to turn the screws on that and, and got blown out by the Democrat Party Party establishment, in my opinion. Yeah, well, what's interesting is I think that both Trump and, and AOC and, and the liberal wing of the Democratic Party they, they talk a certain way because they want to use people as foot soldiers, right? I mean, and that's really what it's about, right? The idea is she'll talk this way so that all the leftists and socialists will go out into the streets and, and support her and, and fight against the right and all of that. And I think Trump talks the way he does because he wants to use people on the right. He wants people on the right to be his foot soldiers. And th this is capitalism in crisis. Karl Marx wrote a very important pamphlet called The 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon, where he talked about... When capitalism enters a crisis, a systemic crisis, um, the rate of profit goes down, the capitalists are fighting with each other, and so different factions in the ruling class try to seize control of the government in order to stabilize the crisis. The thing is, they all want to stabilize the crisis, they just don't want to pay for it. They want the other guys to pay for it, right? Um, and in France in 1851, there was a big crisis in society, mass unemployment, hunger, etc. So the banker capitalists, they picked Napoleon Bonaparte's nephew, Louis, Louis Bonaparte, um, you know, and he became Napoleon III. They put him into power, 1851, with the coup d'etat. He became the military dictator, and he proceeded to impose, you know, huge, you know, regulations on the factory owners. You know, he built railroads. He created free hospitals for low-income people in France and st stabilized the economy at the expense of the factory owners on behalf of the bankers, right? And Marx wrote about it. He was living in France at the time. There was a lot of confusion, right, um, you know, about what was actually going on, but it was about trying to stabilize society. And, he, and you, know, he, you know, Louis Bonaparte, he had this image like he was coming out of the French Revolution. He was trying to stabilize society on behalf of, of, of one faction of the ruling class at the expense of the other. And I think there's a division in our ruling class, and, and Trump would like society to be more stable. You know, the people backing AOC would like society to be more stable. They just don't want to pay for it themselves. They want the other capitalists to pay for it. Um, so it's about, you know, using working class people as foot soldiers 
in this in this battle between the elites. Um, and and if you look at, at the history of, of the world, really, every Marxist revolution uh, has started out as this kind of struggle, right? That, that the capitalists begin to fight amongst each other as, as the economy gets into crisis. And they begin to want to use the state to kind of settle their scores. And they begin to recruit workers as their foot soldiers in this battle. Okay, um, that, uh, that, that makes sense. Now, um, uh, back, back to, uh, circling back to Kamala here, uh, um, with uh, Trump derangement in full effect, uh, the American people uh, haven't really given much thought to uh, Kamala. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they haven't given much thought to who they, uh, a lot of people were voting for Trump or against Trump. And uh, uh, Biden very much presented himself as sort of a, a placeholder of normalcy. Right. Uh, if, if you liked how normal and boring things were during the Obama administration, you know, press Biden for more of that. Uh, you know, it was sort of kind of a, an anti campaign where he hid in his basement and was not Trump. Right. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it was uh, it was successful. Um, um, some uh, uh, some are arguing whether it was successful or not. But I, I believe he uh, ended up winning fair and square. Um, but. Uh, what are some key things that uh, people need to know about uh, Vice President Elect Harris that, uh, that that the media hasn't told us that uh, uh, that, that we would we would normally have known if she had gone through a normal selection process? Well, um, she tried to execute a man who very well could have been innocent on death row. Um, you know, this man was facing execution, Kevin Cooper. Um, and, you know, DNA evidence was presented. Like, should we get DNA evidence to see if he's actually guilty of the crime? She tried to prevent DNA evidence from being admitted. She didn't care uh, to acquire DNA evidence. She tried to block it. The governor overrode her. DNA evidence was acquired, and Kevin Cooper was taken off death row. That's called attempted murder, right? I mean, if, if, if there's somebody who's innocent, right, and there's evidence that could acquit them, and you try to block it, uh, that's that's... That's pretty serious, right? People want to get mad about Donald Trump saying deeply offensive things, and I am mad about that, but but that's not attempted murder. I mean, this is, she tried to take an innocent person's life. Um, you know, she tried to keep people in prison uh, longer than their sentences in the hopes of using them as cheap labor uh, to, to put out fires uh, and not employ union firefighters, right? You know, they have this program in California where they use prisoners to to do firework, right? And prison, prisoners, they're, they're, you know, they get time off their sentence, basically. They're working for free. Well, there's firefighters who get paid, you know, wages and have benefits and have labor unions to represent them. Well, we can just replace them with prison labor, right? Uh, and this is a trend we see. I mean, she, she seems to have no sense of morality, right? And, um, and, uh, you know, I, I talk in the book about the fact that she, you know, she destroyed the lives of well over 1,500 people for smoking marijuana, then was asked if she ever smoked it herself and laughed about it, thought it was funny. Never occurred to her that, like, you know, she locked up all these people for doing it, so maybe she shouldn't laugh about doing it herself and, and say she did it herself. Um, the other thing, though, um, and, you know, the only reason I went here, a lot of people said to me, why did you go here? You know, you shouldn't have gone there. Well, I went there because Kamala goes there, okay? There has never been, in my experience, any presidential candidate in all of American history who has discussed their own childhood as much as Kamala Harris has, okay? She went there. I mean, Kamala Harris, you know, had T-shirts with her 10-year-old self on them as a campaign. She shouted, that little girl was me in the middle of her campaign. Uh, in the middle of a debate with Joe Biden. She shouted that, made that a catchphrase of her campaign. She seems to invoke her own childhood so much throughout her campaign in a way that is just just bizarre. That caused me to have to then investigate. And I investigated, and I found out, uh, you know, that her father, not only as he denounced her campaign, um, but he talked about a very ugly custody battle that went on uh, where he, you know, lost custody to Kamala and her sister, um, and, and was deprived of it. He thinks that was on account of the fact that he's, he's black, uh, that he's a, a Jamaican man. And despite the fact that he, you know, is a college professor and was educated, he was deemed to not be worthy of having custody of his daughters. Um, and he, he describes some pretty disturbing things. Um, on top of that, it's pretty clear that Kamala has some pretty intense rage, uh, some very, very intense rage. Um, and she seems to invoke her childhood 
when she's doing things that are rather not good. For example, when she started imprisoning the, the parents of, of kids who skipped school, right? And she started doing this, bragging about it, laughing about what a great policy it was to just lock in jail, lock up these, these low-income parents whose kids had skipped school. Um, when she brags about this, she starts invoking her own childhood. You know, I would never be anywhere if it weren't for my education. So depriving a child of education is a crime. It's about her. You know, it's not so much about the law. It's not about right and wrong. It's about her own trauma. It's about her own rage. She is taking revenge for whatever happened to that little girl. And we don't know what it was. She hates her father. That's pretty clear. And her father's, you know, pretty much hates her as well. I mean, when you're, when you're running for president and you come out to the national media and, and, and call her campaign a travesty of identity politics, that's a pretty strong denunciation. <laughs> so, you know, her father and her are not on good terms. She hates her father. She's angry about something that happened in her childhood. And all of society, uh, you know, morality aside, that justifies whatever she does. She's explosive and full of rage, it seems. Um, it's, it's rather disturbing, you know. Uh, you know, people want to call people psychopaths and sociopaths. She's not that. She's a chronic narcissist. And she's a vengeful and sadistic narcissist, if there ever was one. Um, she's obsessed with her own image. And other people are just kind of background noise. The, the people she put in, marijuana, uh, in jail for smoking pot, they're just background noise. They don't matter, right? You know, the people, you know, Kevin Cooper, who she almost killed, he doesn't matter, right? It's about her. It's about the world understanding how hard her life has been, how unfair the world has been to her. It's about making the world pay, making the world understand what she's been through. She is a dangerously cruel and sadistic narcissist. And that yeah, probably yeah, makes she, put I, that I probably love her puts me. Life, she's, yeah. Uh, uh, kind of acting out her private trauma. I, indeed. See that. And it's very obvious if you look at it. And again, I wouldn't bring this up if she didn't bring it up constantly. If she hadn't made the fact that she was a small child an essential part of her campaign and her image, I would never have brought up her family issues and stuff. But she brings it up, so that gives me the right oh. to look into it as a reporter. Well, what it, what it reminds me of, I mean, uh, uh, Trump, I, I don't, I, I'm not absolving him. He, he has a similar uh, uh, host of issues, but he's, uh, he's no longer uh, going to be the president here in a few weeks. But uh, if you remember uh, Hillary Clinton uh, several years ago, uh, where uh, uh, we came, we saw he died, and then she started cackling maniacally, like uh, just completely lost control of herself in the interview, was just so pleased with herself. Mm-hmm that she had orchestrated this man getting sodomized to death by yeah. a, a gang of violent terrorist extremists. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's that's her idea of funny. Yeah, That's her idea of uh, foreign policy, uh, of diplomacy, of uh, uh, statecraft and leadership. Uh, and uh, you're, you're telling me that uh, uh, Hillary Clinton and her team basically uh, selected Kamala as, as their stalking horse uh, for their agenda? Indeed. There was a meeting in Long Island, uh, in the Hamptons, where the same people who had put their money behind Hillary Clinton made a strategic decision to put their money behind Kamala Harris. And this was noted in the press. It was like not a secret at all. What's interesting, though, is when you talk about Hillary Clinton and the way she cackled about the killing of Gaddafi and all of that, it's very interesting that the Hillary Clinton State Department and, and the Democratic Party, like foreign policy apparatus, is full of people with a similar biography to Kamala Harris when it comes to their family history. And, uh, you know, you don't want to get all conspiratorial here, but personality profiling is a big part of CIA research, right? And so, you know, Kamala Harris, there's a divorce. She's estranged from her father, grew, idealizes her mother. Now she's in politics. That's the exact, and she was a prosecutor for a long time, right? Amy Klobuchar, exact same story, right? Mother and father divorced. Father was an alcoholic, beat her mother up a bunch, you know, they, they divorced from each other, estranged from the father, becomes a criminal prosecutor. Same story. Samantha Power, exact same story, right? Growing up in Ireland, her father's an alcoholic. Uh, the mom, you know, takes, takes Samantha Power uh, to the United States. The dad dies of alcohol poisoning. Uh, and she becomes a, a prosecutor in her own way. She becomes an international prosecutor. She spends her life building the case for war mainly against governments around the world that happen to be led by powerful men who have like a fatherly figure, uh, a fatherly image, right? Like, you know, like Gaddafi, like Milosevic, like, you know, and, and you look at this, it's very, very interesting, right? And I mean, you know, who was Kamala Harris locking up primarily? Black men, like her father. That's who she was locking up, right? Um, you know, I mean, it, it, it's quite bizarre. And, you know, you know, 
for average people, of course, the government's not studying our personalities in great depth and trying to figure out everything that makes us tick. But for somebody who's the president of the United States, their personality, figuring out how to manipulate them to get them to do what you want them to do is very, very important. There's you know billions of dollars on the line for big corporations. And the fact that, and I, I, in the book, I get into the odd similarities between Obama and Bill Clinton's life story. And they seem to line up pretty perfectly and they have very similar life stories. Trump and George W. Bush, despite, you know, very different rhetoric, have a very similar life story. And, and, it, and if you look at that, right, and, and, and it's pretty clear that, that people are selected for that office based on kind of an assessment, not of how strong they are, but rather of how easily manipulated they are. You know, Obama was very reluctant to go into Libya. And the way they convinced him to bomb Libya uh, was they, they told him that, that, uh, that, in, you know, that Gaddafi said he was going to go house to house in Libya. And he was going to go house to house, and that meant he was going to search for the terrorists. They told Obama that meant he was going to kill everyone in every house. And Obama didn't believe them at first. And Ben Rhodes has written a memoir about this. They hammered Obama for a week. Right. Samantha Power, Hillary Clinton, all of them were telling Obama Gaddafi is going to go in there. He's going to slaughter an entire city in Benghazi. He's going to go house to house and you could have stopped it. And everyone's going to remember you as the guy who could have saved Benghazi and you didn't do it. And they just hammered Obama until finally he said, you know what, we got to send the cruise missiles. And oh, I don't think Obama even realized he was authorizing regime change, as wild as that is. He thought he was authorizing a no flies. I mean, and and. You know, the Hillary Clinton State Department, you look at it, in many cases, they were doing things that Obama, as the president of the United States, didn't even know they were doing. After the coup in Honduras, where the government of Honduras was toppled, after that coup, uh, you'll remember Obama was asked about, hey, the military just overthrew the government of Honduras. He said, oh, that's not legal. He didn't even know it happened. Meanwhile, Hillary Clinton had been meeting with the coup plotters and the State Department and talking to the Honduran ambassador. She'd set up the whole thing. Right. And um, and uh, when Obama got rid of Hillary Clinton in his second term, replaced her with John Kerry, you'll notice U.S. foreign policy completely shifted. All of a sudden, it wasn't about spreading revolution. It was about it was about signing the Iran nuclear deal. It was about signing a deal with Cuba. You know, sudden it was about negotiating a peace treaty in Colombia with the FARC. And, you know, John Kerry even met with the, the FARC rebels uh, from Colombia. And, you know, things things shifted. And that, that as much as Obama was an awful president, even he realized how dangerous, how extremely dangerous what Kamala Harris represents is. And I'm convinced that Tulsi Gabbard realized that as well, right? And that Tulsi Gabbard, she's active due to U.S. military, um, you know, and I think that she represents much bigger than herself. And that there are many people in the back room at the State Department and in the Pentagon who are looking at the world and how much stronger the terrorist groups have gotten, how much out of control this crisis of mass migration where people are fleeing their homelands and, and you know, and, and how out of control the world has gotten because of what Hillary Clinton did. Um, and they, they want to stop it. And they don't want Kamala to be in there as, as you know, trying to wage this insane you know, psychotic, you know, active global revolution. They want to stop this. They, they realize there is a big danger on the horizon that, that there are some folks in Silicon Valley, right? And Facebook and Twitter were very essential. And I talk about this in the book. I talk about Jared Andrew Cohen, uh, who was on the board of Google Alphabet and, and worked with the Hillary Clinton State Department to stage uprisings around the world. I talk about all of this. And there, there are a lot of people within our government who want to stop Kamala Harris and are afraid of what, what she has to offer in both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. But these interests uh, in Silicon Valley are very, very powerful, and it seems like they maneuvered uh, to get her back uh, on the ticket. And even though less than 1% of the American people voted for her, she could be our next president. That's scary in my view. Oh, I, I, I agree. Uh, now, you, you talked about uh, that, that interview where she had... Uh, 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 laughed about smoking weed while, of course, uh, uh, aggressively prosecuting uh, nonviolent uh, marijuana users. Yeah. Um, and she had uh, drawn Jamaica into that in, in a way that, that that's, I mean, it, it just kind of goes to her, uh, uh, I, I would call it a lack of intelligence because that's, that, that's really classless uh, to define the country of Jamaica buy marijuana use like that to be like, Oh, well, you know, once I, my family's Jamaican, so we're all on drugs like Jamaicans. Yeah. Uh, and I, I see why her, uh, the Jamaican half of her family, uh, cracked down on that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, Jamaica I mean, it takes itself pretty seriously. Uh, 
Indeed. Uh, it's, it's, in a lot of ways, a, a very successful country that uh, has a lot to be proud about. Uh, but this leads up to my question. It's, it's my opinion that President Trump has uh, exploited uh, white identitarian resentments uh, to promote his crony capitalist agenda. Uh, uh, would you agree that uh, Vice President-elect Harris has a similar history of exploiting her identity uh, while not actually working in the interests of people of color? Sort of... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, you know, especially at a time when there's mass outrage about the prison industrial complex and such, um, you know, I mean, you know, the fact that she is a woman of color has kind of enabled her to um, to carry out policies that might be, you know, more called out. Look, I mean, if some Republican had tried to block evidence and get a, a black man executed, you know, I mean, that would be a, a, a white Republican prosecutor was running for office and done, did that. It would be all over TV. But Kamala Harris, you know, she is a woman of color herself. One thing that I think is amusing, and I don't want to say too much about this because it's really not for me to say, but, you know, there's one big similarity between Barack Obama and Kamala Harris, which is that neither of them are descendants of American slaves, you know, and that, that has been pointed out by a lot of black nationalists, right? You know, you know, the majority of black people in the United States are descended from slaves in the U.S. South. Kamala Harris is descended from a Jamaican and descended from a woman from India. You know, Barack Obama was descended from a white woman and a guy from Kenya. And that, that, that you know, while they may look like the descendant of slaves, they don't share the same heritage. They don't share the same culture and background. And, you know, black nationalists in the United States will talk about the black nation of America and many black nationalists, again, not for me to say, will actually argue that, that while they, they may look like a, an American black person, they're not culturally part of the same nationality. And I think that's quite interesting, you know, and, and would the U.S. government actually trust a descendant of an African slave in the office of the White House? I, I wonder about that, right? I wonder. Well, I, I, I think that goes back to my sort of a, a white saviorism, seeing American blacks as inferior in a way that we don't so much with uh, sort of immigrant elite uh, blacks like you have with Obama. I mean, and you saw that with uh, uh, Ben Carson and Herman Cain. Uh, everybody spoke really nicely about them. They're uh, two very successful, accomplished, and, and well-spoken individuals who were uh, qualified. Uh, but there was a sort of implied understanding by the media that these were not serious candidates, that they were to be sort of uh, condescended, to, even, you know, <laughs> even being a liter a, literally a brain surgeon, uh, if you're still uh, a, a culturally a black American and have the mannerisms and heritage and identity as such, mm -hmm. uh, there, there's kind of an understanding that no, you're... Uh, you're not as serious as as the rest of the candidates. Oh, well, right, and there is a there is still a a deep uh, distrust for for African Americans. I think within the U.S. establishment, no question about it. Um, and uh, and and uh, and that kind of reveals itself in these kind of strange instances. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I guess, and I, I well, there's other the other factors that could play into this. But what's the next question? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, um. Getting Rich Without Capitalism, uh, I've been uh, okay. reading that too. Uh, it's also by Caleb Malpin, uh, uh, available where all fine books are sold here. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to quote uh, from, from your article about Jack Ma Marxism. Oh, okay. Is it Ma? Yeah. Uh, the world famous uh, founder of Alibaba may be a billionaire CEO, but the world he is, uh, uh, the words he's repeating around the word, uh, world contain echoes of Karl Marx, Vladimir Lenin, and Mao Zedong. Uh, it may be difficult for the untrained ear to identify it, but it should be no surprise that this uh, uh, rock star of China's centrally planned economy is on good terms with the deeply ideological ruling party. For those with a deeper understanding, Marxist undertones can be found all throughout Mao's uh, technological optimism. That leads me to my question. So, um, in the West, uh, watching what's happening with China is uh, infinitely fascinating for me. Um, in the West, there's there's a lot of talk about stakeholder capitalism, uh, mm -hmm. especially surrounding this Great Reset Initiative being pushed by the Davos crowd lately. Um, are, are corporations in capitalist countries uh, in the West capable of disciplining themselves to the best interest of the people and the climate? It, it, are, are they even... Uh, what, what you see happening where uh, the market is disciplining itself to the welfare of the Chinese people and the best interests of the Chinese nation uh, with a long-term vision. Is that possible without uh, the revolution and having a vanguardist party uh, on top with a boot on their neck? 
Well, it, it's interesting uh, because I wrote that essay after I got back from Russia. Uh, when I was in Russia, I attended uh, the uh, the Valdi Discussion Club, which is a think tank that is set up, you know, that Putin speaks at every year. And I had the honor of actually participating in a few of the sessions, uh, you know, and, and at the Valdi Discussion Club. And Jack Ma spoke at a panel with Vladimir Putin um, and, and some other world leaders. Um, and, uh, you know, I was sitting in the room. I was, you know, maybe 30, 40 feet away from, from Jack Ma. And I thought, this guy's a communist. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing this. I'm, he- I'm hearing the Communist Manifesto. I'm hearing historical materialism coming out of his, his mouth. Um, and it's funny. So I wrote that essay. Now it's a matter of public. Now it's been revealed that he's actually a card carrying member of the Communist Party. Like he's actually a Communist Party member. Um, but he's a billionaire. Right. And, and how does this make any sense? Well, it makes sense because the goal of, of Marxism is to create a vast material abundance. Right. Um, now, I think what you were getting at in your question, when you talk about these corporations, the corporations in China that are that are that exist, like, you know, Alibaba, like Huawei Technologies, which is the biggest telecommunications manufacturer in the world. They are technically private, but they, are, they don't really function according to market logic. At any point, the government can just come in and say, you know what, you're doing this. Nope, you're doing that, right? They all have party cells in the company. They all have government managers who kind of work with them and tell them kind of what to do. Um, and even though they're private, they don't function according to, to the market. Um, and in, in the case of Huawei Technologies, it, it depends on government subsidies, and most of the board of directors are Chinese military people. So, you know, at this, I mean, you can't really describe it as a free market corporation. It is technically private, meaning that there are private investors who get a return on their investment when they, when they make a profit, uh, you know, meaning that it's not like, it's not a government-owned industry. Uh, but it, w- it was chartered by the government. It was set up because the government wanted it to exist. And, and a lot of corporations in China that are nominally private are like that. Um, I tell people that, that the Chinese system is kind of the opposite of what we have here. In the United States, the corporations control the government. In China, the government controls the corporations. Um, and I think that that's the difference. And that I think you need a market sector in a socialist society. The, the Soviet model of doing everything, where everything is run by the government, that, that's not going to work, right? You need a market sector to some degree or other. And, and China has shown that while you, know, you have government control of banking, you have government control of major industries, you can also have a market sector you know, to foster tech innovation and things like that. And I think that, uh, that that's, um, that's pretty clearly demonstrated by China. And Jack Ma, if you listen to him, he's talking about historical materialism. I mean, he's talking about, about the Marxist understanding of technology leading to social crises because of the anarchy of production. I mean, he understands the Marxist, uh, the Marxist method of analyzing the world, and he's applying that with a message of tech optimism at a time when technology is, is resulting in all this chaos in the world. Well, he's arguing, basically, that, uh, that, that, that society as a whole needs to take control of the means of production and operate them in a rational way. Um, and I think that, that that comes across when he speaks. He's subtle about it, right? He's not pushing, he's not screaming revolution. China says politics outside of its own border are none of its business. Um, but at the end of the day, if you listen to what he's saying, he's basically arguing technology is a good thing if profits are not in command. And I think he's right. Oh, I, 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 I agree. Uh, we have every reason to be pessimistic here in the West uh, because the, the robots mean uh, our jobs get destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And uh, the, there's no government system in place. We've seen in the last year uh, the this this federal government will absolutely drop you and your entire family directly on your faces in the street and uh, toss six hundred dollars at you in the middle of winter. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, be resentful uh, about that six hundred dollars uh, when they're the ones who called for the uh, who put the you know who took your job away. Uh, but uh, it's despicable. Uh, but anyway, next question. Sure. Uh, and we can keep uh, going. Speak- we don't have to oh. cut it in an hour. We can keep going. So it's fine. Oh, okay. Well, I'm, I'm getting close to out of questions okay. here. All right. Um, no problem. Uh, you, you speak a lot about the uh, capitalist crisis of uh, overproduction laid down in Dallas Capital, right? Uh, it's been like 20 years since I read it. Don't, uh, don't expect me to remember much. Uh, uh, would you describe our current market reality and wealth inequality as a product of that? And, and can... Could it be resolved by something like UBI or a jobs guarantee? Is there an off-ramp in American politics from this crisis that's building? Well, um, it's definitely a crisis of, of overproduction. Look, the capitalist is constantly trying to advance technology. He wants to produce as many goods as he can, but pay as little as he possibly can to the workers in order to create it. So he replaces workers with machines. He makes workers who are still employed more easily replaceable by de-skilling the jobs. 
The capitalist is always looking to produce as much as he can for as little as he can. The problem is the worker is also the consumer. And when you do that, when you eliminate jobs with technology, when you drive wages down, when you set up a, a global system where a single computer can be made in 50 different countries or something like that, the result is that you get a situation where people can't buy back the products that are produced. And this is called overproduction. And it is just the built-in problem of capitalism. It really gets down to the fact that, uh, that the wage the worker gets paid you know, is never enough to buy back the entire product he produces. He only gets paid a fraction of the ultimate cost of the product. So you're always going to have more products than you have workers able to consume it, right? You know, and that's just the built-in problem. And Marx describes this. Um, you talk about, you know, technology leads to what's called the falling rate of profit, where he's producing more, but his rate of profit on each item is decreasing. And this is, this is the natural problem of capitalism. Now, when it comes to the situation we're in now, we've just had a huge technological leap, the computer revolution. And as a result of that, we're now having a huge economic problem, right? This is, you know, World War I came after, you know, great technological advances led to some great panics and economic depressions. World War II came after the Great Depression, which was largely caused by Henry Ford and his great breakthroughs in the assembly line. Um, and so now, the computer revolution is like the greatest advance we've had in a long time. I mean, I mean, you know, artificial intelligence and 3D printers and like you don't need assembly line workers at this point. So this is leading us to a prolonged crisis of capitalism. And, um, you know, what's going to solve it? If the government just gives a job guarantee, is that going to solve it? Not really. I mean, it'll help. It'll alleviate some of the suffering, but it won't solve it. Universal basic income, again, I'm for it. It would alleviate some of the suffering but it won't solve the problem. The problem is production for profit. As long as profits are in command of the economy, you're still gonna have this problem, right? That it's only with central planning of the economy um, and human reason dictating production, not the chaos of the market or the anarchy of production, that this problem is gonna be resolved. And that's what they have in China. In China, the state controls the means of production and plans it out. And the result has been a society rising up from poverty. And the Soviet Union became a global superpower invented space travel, invented the AK-47 rifle, uh, you know, with central planning. Um, and that, that, you know, Libya became the most prosperous country on the African continent with central planning. The biggest lie we've heard our whole lives is that, oh, it doesn't work. Socialism doesn't work. I mean, it's worked very, very well, you know, comparatively speaking. It's worked pretty well around the world, despite the, the flaws and hardships. So, um, you know, I mean, we can have a planned economy. It can work. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the you know, it needs to be adjusted. Things have changed and we would obviously have to develop our own uniquely American version of it for it to work here. But I, I do think that, that you, you would need a, a you need a socialist society to resolve this problem or mass destruction. You can have that, too. Right. I mean, I guess, you know, if you, if you blow up half the world. Right. That's how the, the Great Depression ended is there was a big, huge war. And, uh, you know, every every major city outside of the United States in, in the world was blown to bits with with bombs and tanks and guns and mass death and millions of people killing each other. And look, uh, the capitalist economy restarted. We had the post-war economic expansion. So, um, you know, mass destruction and death and some kind of huge catastrophe might be able to, you know, buy us a, a few more decades or something. But at the end of the day, capitalism's time is up, right? History is like a train speeding forward. You've got hunter-gatherer civilization. Then you've got the rise of, of the, the slave empires, Greece, Rome, etc. And then you've got the rise of feudalism in Europe. And now, you know, you have capitalism, and capitalism will eventually give way to socialism, which is a higher stage. And eventually, socialism will give way, in my view, uh, ultimately, you know, we're talking many thousands of years from now, to a society with so much prosperity and abundance that the state can wither away, right? And the need for any coercion can go away. And we can actually just have a society with so much prosperity uh, that, you know, people can just kind of do what they want to do and take what they need based on vast material abundance. And human rights and freedom, you'll notice people get more free based on how stable the society is and how much abundance there is. The more prosperous a society is, the more stable it is, the more free you are. But, you know, if you go back to the, the economy of medieval Europe, no one was talking about human rights and freedom because it wouldn't have worked because they, at that level of instability, that level of economic development, forget it, right? And that, that different political forms come with different modes of production and that the road to a world that is so prosperous uh, is also the road to a world where you could actually, you know, move away from coercion and state repression. Right. Uh, I'm coming from a, a radical traditionalist uh, perspective from the perennialist school. 
Uh, but I, I feel like if you uh, if you look at uh, what Wanon and Evla were talking about as far as the cycle, you can almost overlay them with uh, Marxist uh, hmm. historical materialism. Uh, um, but that's uh, that, that's where I'm coming from. But I, that, I, at the end of the day, uh, you end up with a similar crisis of the market and the merchants uh, of the modern world. Well, uh, cannibalizing. Well, let me say, right? you know, Evola, I've read Evola, okay? And, you know, he writes about what he calls the demonic nature of the economy. And what's interesting about that is I think that a lot of the, the folks on the left would agree with everything he writes about the demonic nature of the economy, right? This is right-wing thinking. There's too much stuff. And I believe Evola's criticism of Mussolini and Hitler was, oh, they were trying to raise the level of productivity. They were advancing technology, and that's bad. We need to just be happy with what we have and be content. Um, and what's weird is I actually, I've talked about this in my book and other places, is that Evola's ideas and the ideas of what I call like the synthetic left are actually quite similar, right? I mean, the synthetic left, they love Tibetan Buddhism, right? They, they, they love India and the mystical religions that come out of India, um, you know, I mean, and that, you know, that those ideas, Evola is all about that if you read Evola, but those are very right-wing ideas. Evola, you know, he liked the idea of the caste system in India. Everyone's born into their caste. They know where they are. There's no strikes. There's no protests. There's no rebellion because everyone just knows their place, right? Tibetan society under the Dalai Lama was a lot like that. And, uh, you know, I actually think that, that in a lot of ways, you know, what, what you can call the synthetic left is not really left. It's actually, it's more like traditionalist right wing, especially a lot of the Eastern mysticism that we get on the left. I mean, do you, do you, do you think I have a point there or no? Uh, I, I think you do, though uh, where I'm coming from is sort of a left-hander tradition. It would, it would require uh, a, a completely separate tangent for me to explain it. Oh, sure. But you're, okay. you're absolutely right about uh, the, the problem of conservatives and, and trying to walk backwards. I agree with Marx that we're, uh, we really have uh, no choice but to go along with this uh, this progressive cycle that we're in. The idea that you can walk back the cycles hmm. uh, and go back to the golden age, uh, sort of uh, climb back up the water slide, um, is, is entirely uh, wrong-headed. Hmm. Um, and uh, we uh, the the next age is the manual age, uh, towards the age of, of the worker, hmm. uh, and uh, we we need to figure out how to get there uh, in, in an orderly manner because the the mercantile age is the contradictions within it, the crises within it, the corruption of the elite within it. It's coming to an end, and hmm. uh, um, you, you have your Marxist analysis, which I believe in in a lot of ways I I, I, I quibble on, on details and I'm not properly a Marxist by any stretch. Mm. But I, I believe uh, uh, a, a Marxist uh, would have a better idea of what's coming than your typical neoliberal. That's for damn sure. Interesting. Um, but anyway, uh, speaking of neoliberals, uh, Andrew Yang, uh, did you read his book, uh, War on Normal People? I did. Um, yeah. What, what about it? Well, uh, I, are you optimistic about, because uh, towards the end of the book especially, he obviously promotes UBI and he speaks uh, to a lot of the issues uh, uh, me, me as a uh, white Midwestern trucker, uh, he, he very much was speaking to and about the issues I'm concerned about, about the automation uh, that, that's uh, going to be taking my lifestyle away from me in due time and everything. Uh, but towards the end, he started talking about uh, reforms, uh, sort of the stakeholder capitalist reforms. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, so you're, you're thinking kind of like with Louis Napoleon that there is a real chance here that this Davos-style reform could gain traction, or do you think they've reached a point of dereliction where they're going to um, choke on their own vomit here uh, and, and not be able to repair themselves? Oh, they're coming out of this crisis vicious. I'll tell you that much. I mean, they, they are ready to... I'm sorry, but yeah, we're heading for... You know, they never let a good crisis go to waste. It's very funny. Naomi Klein wrote a book called uh, called Shock Doctrine about disaster capitalism. And you'll notice she talks a very different game. She's not talking about that book anymore because it seems like that's what we're heading for. I mean, look, I mean, this pandemic, right? I mean, as much as I, I don't deny that COVID exists, I don't deny that we need restrictions and, and all of that. But, but let's be real that Jeff Bezos has made out like a bandit. Uh, you know, Bill Gates has made out like a bandit. Uh, the the ultra rich have been making out like a bandit while the small businesses have been crushed, um, and they are going to come out of this uh, with a higher level of of not only a monopoly on the market but ability to carry out radical like social engineering policies. 
um, and and you know they are they their their monopoly will be secured, and they will be trying to control the American population and the population around the world much more effectively uh, without resistance. And they yeah no no good crisis ever goes to waste, right? They they are moving ahead with their agenda, and that that managerial wing, that Eastern establishment, Silicon Valley, the folks behind Kamala Harris. Uh, they are ready to hit the ground running. I expect we're going to see a lot more internet censorship. We're going to see a lot more attempts at social control. Um, you know, one thing that I think we're going to see um, is I think that we're going to start seeing the politicization of mental health. I've predicted, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, police brutality, it, you know, the fact that we're having a national conversation about it is very, very good. But the fact that now uh, there are these mental health squads that are being formed and they're already trying to say that if you don't agree with the latest war and you don't agree that we should all hate China, you must be crazy. You know, and I think they're getting ready to start, you know, you know, some of the policies that, that people talk about with the old Soviet Union, where they, they put the dissidents in the mental hospital. And and, you know, we're, 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 we're heading in that direction, I think, you know, and, and the politicization of mental health and anyone who disagrees with things must be crazy and, and antisocial. And I think we're heading in a, in a kind of a authoritarian direction. That said, though, Andrew Yang, I'm mostly optimistic about Andrew Yang at this point. Right. Um, you know, uh, I think that that. He is doing things that the Democratic Party is very afraid to do. Like he is talking about the fact that that many white working class people hate the Democratic Party on like a gut level. They just hate the Democratic Party. And if the Democratic Party really wants to get anything done, they need to do something about that. It's not, you know, and that that a lot of the base of the Democratic Party, their response to working class white people is to just shout, oh, shut up, you racist, you white privileged. And that's that's not an answer. Right. That that, you know, and that that there are low income white working people in the United States who are suffering right now. Um, and the Democratic Party, rather than, you know, stepping up to the plate and being the party that could make life better for those folks, you know, instead has become the party of shaming those folks, telling them they're bad. They're a basket of deplorables. They deserved to be poor. And, uh, you know, that and and that's that's very disturbing. Well, Andrew Yang has made a point of saying that, look, you know, that that, you know, that while he's, you know, absolutely opposed to racism and, and police brutality and such, that the needs of white working people should be taken into priority. And that if the Democratic Party were smart enough to actually, you know, champion the rights of all working people, not play the identity politics game, but actually fight for all working people, they would be unstoppable as a political party. They haven't done that. Instead, they've become the party of waging culture wars. Um, and uh, the other thing is that, uh, that Andrew Yang you know, his proposals are quite dramatic, right? Universal basic income. Uh, he wants to have this Yang report where he would report on the economic statistics. It seems to me he wants to be like the, the Lee Kuan Yew of America, right? He wants to be the, the strong man in office who fixes things and uses state power to fix things. He wants to be a Bonapartist. The thing is, though, we have a big ruling class here with a lot of different factions. And in order to get done what he would like to get done, not to get to socialism, just to do what he would like to do, he would have to build a very, very big mass movement of working people. And one thing could lead to another. And right now, I think he's moving in a good direction. That said, though, he could be potentially extremely dangerous, extremely dangerous, right? I mean, it, I mean, it, it's possible that that he could start getting things done for American capitalism in a way that, that could be potentially dangerous, too. There's potential danger there. But that's the thing, is that often, well... Often in politics, right, um, you know, you know, great potential for good and great potential for evil kind of walk hand in hand. And that's actually the truth about politics. People don't realize that. People want to make it like a like a, an old Western where there's the good guy and the bad guy. But often, often, you know, when po when political leaders are very dramatic and very, very powerful, um, you know, you know, they have the potential to be good or bad. Um, it's a question of which is the most dominant and that right now all over the world, what we have are weak governments. We have pathetic, weak governments that sit there and let the corporations do whatever they want and don't really govern. Right. And I've said many times that, you know, you know, we in the United States, we need a government of action that will fight for working families and will take dramatic moves to improve people's lives. And I think many working people across the United States want that. They want a government that will govern and get things done. And we've been, you know, we've had it pounded into our heads for over years. The government needs to stay out, you know, government hands off. Well, I think a lot of Americans are saying, look, I'm suffering here. 
I want a government to come in and, and govern and fix things and make sure the roads are paved and make sure people have decent jobs and get rid of, cancel the student debt and actually improve things in the country. Um, and I, I think a lot of Americans are, are ready for that. And that this kind of, this, you know, just, oh, we can't have state power. Everyone's an individual, no collectivism. Uh, that's starting to wear off. That's what the ruling class would like. That's what the, the synthetic left wants. That's what the, the neocon right that pushes neoliberal economics wants. But deep down, a lot of Americans want a government that will get things done. They want a government of action. Right. And I think uh, uh, Trump, Trump played to that a lot in 2015, uh, the, that idea of actually uh, uh, setting aside those uh, ideologies <coughs> and, and helping Americans. Uh, and that, of course, never, never, came, uh, never came to fruition. But I think that uh, the, the only privilege that the Democratic Party uh, sees is white. And the only color the Republican Party sees is green, uh, leaving the white working class uh, without anywhere to go, in in my opinion. Hmm. Um, But uh, uh, question 10, uh, Representative Gabbard uh, has impressed a lot of us on the dissident right with her opposition to the war machine, her speaking truth to power, and her commitment to civil liberties, uh, when uh, those have fallen out of fashion uh, with, with the inner party. Uh, do you think there's a home for her in either of the two parties? Uh, do you see a potential for uh, a grassroots movement behind her uh, leading into 2024? Well, I think that we're entering a period where, you know, figures like Andrew Yang, figures like Tulsi Gabbard are going to become more common because there's a lot of people that really, really kind of want change. Um, and that, that, that the traditional politics is not going to offer that. And Trump was kind of a a maverick, if you will. I mean, he certainly didn't talk like a normal Republican. And we're going to see more of that. Um, Like I said in my book, I think Tulsi Gabbard represents a lot more than than herself. I think she represents, you know, uh, an apparatus within the military uh, and folks who are deeply concerned about the Hillary Clinton State Department and what they're doing. Um, But, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, it's weird how she was kind of blackballed. You know, I mean, she was, you know, I mean, many times, You know, it was like people would make statements like, well, I think there are good things about all the candidates except for Tulsi Gabbard. You know, she was it was just like she was like blacklisted. And I think that was mainly because of her foreign policy thing. She dared raise the fact that the U.S. government in Syria and in Libya and elsewhere has supported Al Qaeda. And that's just, you know, that's 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 taboo. Look, I mean, you talked about, you know, Gaddafi being killed. One of the fighters in the army of terrorists that overthrew Gaddafi uh, was the guy who blew up the concert in Manchester. Right. I mean, he's the guy who blew up the concert in Manchester. Right. I mean, I mean, this guy was armed and supported by the U.S. government to go to Libya, fight against Gaddafi. Then he goes back to Britain and blows up a concert full of people. Right. You know, I mean, and and I mean, that should have been a moment where people just went, whoa, you know, maybe we shouldn't be arming, you know, terrorist groups. Right. Or look at look at what's going on, you know, all the drug cartels in Mexico and all the the chaos that there's been in this country. Maybe the U.S. government's policy of arming drug cartels and Contras in Latin America to fight socialism in places like Nicaragua and fight socialism in in Venezuela and fight against socialism in Bolivia. Maybe we should stop doing that. Why? I mean, this shouldn't be a taboo subject. It's kind of common sense, right? If you don't like terrorists, you don't like drug dealers. Don't give them guns. Don't give them weapons. I mean, it's, it's not that complicated, right? But it's, it's taboo. You can't go there. And that's because I maintain that, you know, Kamala Harris represents a faction that is committed to fomenting chaos around the world to more effectively secure the rule of, of some, some very select, huge multinational corporations in the United States. Uh, they want to they wanna just unleash chaos around the world in order to, to drive down living standards, reduce the population, and secure their rule. And that is why Kamala Harris is very, very dangerous. And Tulsi Gabbard shows that there are people, even within the government itself, even within the people expected to carry out these policies, who know how dangerous they are. Um, okay. Uh, uh, final question here. Uh, my, my friends and I, this is, this is uh, my, uh, my own uh, off-the-cuff question here. Um, uh, have kind of had this argument for, for years now about whether Trump is actually non-interventionist, uh, which is uh, their opinion, and my opinion, which is that uh, uh, China and Russia uh, have become more assertive and competent geopolitically in the past few years since uh, um, uh, in, in the past uh, five years or uh, slowly escalating, right, building up, uh, to the point where uh, even Bolton, of all people, can't find a war. 
uh, in my opinion, is like in Venezuela, they wanted it, uh, but uh, Chinese advisors uh, were there to uh, um, help Maduro, who probably wouldn't have been able to navigate the complicated situation himself, either in terms of resources or logistics. And I, I just uh, wonder uh, what that means for uh, uh Kamala Harris, whether we're going to uh, even be able to get into a war and what that might look like, given that uh, this is no longer the unipolar world that Hillary Clinton ha- has enjoyed since 1992 to present, right? Indeed. And I mean, we'll just have to see. I think Donald Trump, uh, you know, I, I don't think he was it was the smartest individual. And I think he was more concerned about his career and what what would look good and how he would look in the history books. And it depended who was talking to him here and there. I mean, it, it sounds like on some level he was reluctant to be starting a new war because he knew that was unpopular. Um, and so, you know, I mean, it seems like he pushed back, but it seemed like he was constantly negotiating. And and Mike Pompeo was probably the biggest force for evil within the Trump administration. Um, I'll be happy to see him go, though I'm not too too thrilled with who will replace him. But, um, you know, Mike Pompeo represented a particular wing um, and that, you know, you know, while Trump was not a neocon, you know, the, it was full of neocons, you know, I mean, the administration, Mike Pence, Mike Pence is a neocon, uh, you know, and, uh, and Mike Pompeo is a neocon and that, you know, in my book, I actually talk about the origins of the Christian right, um, and how there was kind of a reinvention of Christianity, uh, after the 1960s political upsurge, uh, to kind of help the neoconservative political movement. And I think that might be of interest, uh, to folks as well, because, because what the evangelical folks preach in the mega churches, right? That's not Christianity. I mean, that's that is a watered down propaganda, lights and mirrors and singing and crying, and it's not Christianity, right? It's a very very watered down uh, propaganda to serve American Empire, right? And that you know, yeah, the I mean, evangelical, uh, right? Uh, yeah, I'm a majority. I am a Christian, uh, you know, um, and and what I believe, uh, you know, the religion that that I identify with that has been around for thousands of years and has done so much good in the world um, is just being utterly distorted by these these folks who are really loyal to uh, to imperialism when it gets down to it, um, and particularly loyal to the right wing of Israeli politics, the Likud party, you know, and uh, you know, uh, it, it's pretty pretty shocking to see uh, what has developed out of the religious right. Uh, yeah, and uh, especially in the last uh, few months with the uh, QAnon and the, the strange, like, uh, 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 Jesus is with Trump sort of... Uh, uh, I haven't I, followed that. Yeah. But I don't bring it up in my work very often because it's it, it, it's just so tacky to me mm-hmm. uh, to uh, present that because I, I, I feel like God is kind of above a lot of these issues uh, yeah. that, that, that we're discussing that's bigger than that. I mean, my, my, my faith... Uh, compels and propels everything I do, but at the same time, this uh, th- this idea that you're seeing from the uh, increasingly deranged Republican Party. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just, I mean, it's, it's great that they're not trusting the mainstream media, don't trust CNN, uh, but the direction they're going is almost as bad. I uh, Sometimes I wonder. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Uh, but on, on that note, uh, it, it, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Sure thing. Um, and, uh, yeah, thank you for your time. And yeah. I encourage uh, my viewers uh, to actually uh, buy this and read this. It's it's not an ideology. I mean, his, his ideology permeates it, of course. Uh, but it's actually a very informative. And uh, with the with the Biden-Harris administration coming, it's, it's important that we, we know what's coming and that we'd be able to anticipate uh, their actions and be able to uh, speak intelligently about this administration, be one step ahead of them. So uh, for uh, for assisting with that, us with that, I uh, uh, thank you for your time, Mr. Martin. Sure. Well, and I thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk about the ideas in my book. Uh, I hope people read about it. Um, and um, I will say that, you know, I, I am glad that there is a, a free discourse here and we are digging into these ideas. And my hope is that Folks in your audience uh, will dig into what I have to say um, and uh, and maybe uh, perhaps look past some of the, the racial identitarianism and, and find ways that all of us of different races and bath- backgrounds and ethnicities can come together and fight for a better America for all working families. Uh, absolutely. And uh, you can you can find more find out more about Caleb at uh, CalebMalpin.com uh, where you can get everything else you need to know. Uh, you have a good evening, Caleb. You too. Thanks.